All right, well, it's almost Christmas. Uh, Wednesday will be the big day, and I hope you're looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to, to Christmas Eve. That should be a fun time. And if I were to ask you guys what your favorite Christmas verse or verses are, I can pretty much uh, foretell the answers. Uh, some of you might say, Isaiah, you know, chapter 7, where it talks about the Lord himself will give us a sign. Or maybe over Isaiah chapter 9, where it talks about uh, his name, the wonderful counselor, mighty God. Those come to mind. Maybe Micah would come to mind, you know, out of you, Bethlehem. Uh, will the Savior come? Or uh, maybe you'd pick some verses from uh, Matthew or Luke chapter 2, uh, where the Christmas story is. But I would uh, be willing to bet money none of you uh, would pick the Christmas verse I'm going to share with you today. And that is Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21. You've probably never heard that uh, referred to as a Christmas verse. And actually I refer to it as my least favorite Christmas verse uh, because I don't like it. <laughs> but, but here's what it says. It says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it, it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Now, why wouldn't I like that? You're a man. Because I'm a man, and if I were a woman, I probably wouldn't like it either. It's called the human condition. We like to make our plans, and then we like to see our plan unfold according to the way we have scripted it in our minds. But there's a problem because God comes along and he says, wait a minute, I have a better plan. I have a bigger plan. You're going to follow my plan. And there we are. We're faced with a dilemma. Are we going to follow God's plan or are we going to follow our plan? Now you may be thinking, okay, so what does all this have to do with Christmas? Because when we think of Christmas, we think of joy, we think of glad tidings, we think of all those things, we think of anticipation, uh, especially if you're this tall, you're anticipating the big day or the big evening as the case may be, uh, when uh, you get to open all the presents and, and those sorts of things. But the first Christmas was completely different from all of these things. There was little joy, there was no real anticipation. Because you remember, when Isaiah prophesied that God himself was going to send us a sign, that this Savior was going to be born, that was roughly 750 years before the first Christmas. How many people do you think were still sitting on the edge of their seats waiting for this Messiah to be born? Probably zero. Exactly. You know, for, where is he? What's changed? What's happened? Nothing. So people had begun to make their own plans, just as we make plans. They'd begin to plan how their lives were going to unfold. Christmas came along and threw a real monkey wrench into a lot of folks' plans. You may say, well, well, how so? Well, think about it. King Herod had a plan, didn't he? His plan was to be the greatest, most beloved ruler since David. And he was working that plan. He was uh, building great facilities and things and uh, expanding the temple and doing all sorts of things uh, to get the folks to love him and expand his influence. But God had a different plan for Herod. There were the religious leaders. They had plans. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests, they were in control of all the religious life of the community and they intended to keep it that way. They had rules that needed to be followed. And their plan was unfolding until Christmas. Even the shepherds had plans. Their plans were a little uh, simpler. Most likely they had planned to spend a quiet evening 
uh, tending the sheep, just taking it easy, sort of kicking back on the mountainside. Then along come these angels, and their plans are turned upside down. What about the, the Magi, the wise men? Uh, they had plans. They were comfortably ensconced somewhere around uh, Babylon, and they were uh, known as astronomers, and they were probably watching the skies and discussing the, the various movements of the planets and things, and they just had a, a nice evening. And their plans were interrupted, weren't they? And all of a sudden, their nice evening turned into, we often don't delve into it, but it turned into an arduous, dangerous journey that took many days to make. So their plans were changed. But the folks that had the biggest monkey wrench, if you will, thrown into their plans were the two we know as Mary and Joseph. Now you think about their lives. You remember, when we read the Bible, we tend to kind of uh, do this thing where these aren't real people. We just kind of think of them as nice stories and that. But we need to remember these are real people living real lives in real circumstances. And so we have a young man and a young woman who are engaged to be married. Now they have plans. Uh, Joseph most likely a plan to marry this beautiful young lady, uh, continue in his career as a carpenter, probably a small contractor, whatever, doing well. And Mary has this dream of marrying this fine young man and having a family and everything is going to be just great. The plan is working. And then along comes God. really messed up Mary and Joseph's plans. You need to understand that in that society, engagement was uh, kind of a three-step process, and it was a lot more formal uh, than what we put on it today. Today, it simply uh, kind of means, I promise to marry so-and-so. Well, in those days when you became engaged, for all practical purposes, you were married. With, with the exception of, of uh, the sexual part of it, you were considered as good as married. Uh, the parents gave their approval, uh, the man paid the dowry, all that was done, then there was a year that they waited, and then they would consummate the marriage. Well, God comes along and he says, I'm going to change your plans. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. He says uh, to Mary, he says, by the way, Mary, you're pregnant. Well, how can that be? I'm a virgin. It's impossible. It can't happen. And if it is happening, if it is possible, woe is me because becoming pregnant when you were engaged was a capital crime with the punishment of death. If you looked at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23 and 24, it lays it out. The Jewish law, and these folks are under the Jewish law, they are Jews, the penalty is death. She could be stoned. Now think about that. Merry Christmas. Here's your Christmas present. You're going to be charged with a capital offense and possibly be stoned to death. You suppose Mary was singing joy to the world? I think not. I think Mary was probably scared to death and you know, was wondering if she was hallucinating or what on earth was going on, what was happening to her life. She had it all laid out so perfectly it was all working so perfectly. How could this be? And if it was, how could a God that claims to love me, that claims to always be looking out for the best for me, do this terrible thing to me? Because if you put yourself in Mary's shoes, she had to look at that as a terrible thing. Her pregnancy was not a cause for great joy. It was not glad tidings to her. It was a possible death sentence. So has God ever messed up your plans? 
Have you ever been working your plan, it's going along just fine, and all of a sudden God says, nope, I want it to go this way. Probably has at some time or another. If he hasn't, hold on. He will. You know, somebody said there are two kinds of coaches in the National Football League, those that have been fired and those that are going to be. <laughs> well, there are two kinds of Christians in the world, those that God has messed up their plans and those that he's going to. Yeah. So just, just hang in there. It'll, it'll happen. The, the question is, how are you going to react when it does happen? Or how did you react when it did happen? Did you react like Mary and Joseph? And we'll talk a little more about that as we go on. Or did you react like Herod? Mary and Joseph, you will remember from the story, though I'm sure they struggled with it, fit into God's plan and went along with God's program. Herod, on the other hand, did not. Herod had all the babies killed, you remember the story, and eventually uh, none of Herod's plans work out. He dies in a very wretched way, not immediately, but eventually. He never becomes the beloved ruler that he wanted to become. The people hated him when he took power, the people hated him just as much on the day he died. Do we respond like Mary and Joseph? Or do we respond like the religious leaders? Remember the religious leaders rejected him because he didn't fit their paradigm of what the Messiah should look like. He didn't fit what we think he ought to be, so we reject him. Sometimes we react that way, don't we? I know I have. Do we react like these religious leaders who were fools? Or do we react like the wise men who followed the star, who sought him out, who gave him glory, who gave him praise, who gave him virtually everything they had? But we'll see maybe as we go along. Why, though, does God mess up our plans in the first place? And I, I mentioned there are three, three basic reasons. One is to get our attention. It's hard to get your folks' attention. You know, you guys get to shaking hands and carrying on, and one or two of you in particular. <laughs> and see, it's, it's even more difficult for God because he has this mass of Christians down here, and we're all busy doing our thing, enjoying ourselves, working our plan, working our program. And he's up here sort of without the microphone trying to say, okay, if you find your seats, whatever, whatever, whatever. And we just keep on doing what we're doing because it's fun. We like it. And, and here's, you know, it's not bad. See, that's the one thing we always fall back on. We say, well, it's not bad. It's not illegal. It's probably not bad, but God has something better. But he needs to get our attention first. So the best way to get our attention is... He messes up our plans. Second reason he does that, because he has a better plan. We think we've got a good plan, but he has a better plan. And the third thing is, he wants us to learn to trust him. Because generally speaking, to carry out God's plan, we have to rely on God. We have to place our faith in Him because His plan is better than ours, but it's bigger than ours. And it's often too big for us. And we can't fathom how we could ever carry out that plan. Again, go back to Mary. Do you think she f could figure this out? Do you think she could rationalize in her mind and think, well, let's see now, I'm pregnant, I'm a virgin, but I'm pregnant anyway. Oh, I, I know. I'll bet it's the Messiah and I'm going to be his mother and uh, he's going to die but he's going to be raised from the dead and this is all going to work out. I don't think so. I don't think she had a clue. But she had faith and therefore she was able to follow through and fit into God's plan. So let's look at these things, these three things. Number one, God is trying to get our attention. And he, he says it very plainly in, in Psalm uh, chapter 81, verse 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me. 
Now, all of you that are parents have uttered those words. Many times out of deep anguish. Because you see what your kids are doing. And you know what the result's going to be. And you say, oh Lord, why won't they just listen to me? Well, God feels the same way about us when we don't listen. You know? He says, oh, if you guys would only listen, you, you could be spared so many things. So here we have Mary and Joseph. God's getting their attention. But they had to make a decision, didn't they? They had to decide, are we going to go with God's plan or are we going to go with our plan? Hmm. We'll see how they answer that. But God loves us. And if we go with his plan, it will spare us a lot of pain. You see, we get ourselves into trouble when we don't follow what God tells us to do. Or conversely, we do what God tells us not to do. <laughs> Have you ever had a surefire plan? Something that you just knew was going to work? And it didn't. Most of us have. Uh -huh. See? Even though we knew it was going to work, there was no way this plan could not work. Again, in Proverbs 16.25, it says, There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Now, for our <clears throat> message today, we can say there's, there are plans that we make but in the end, they fail. Because they weren't God's plans for us. They were our plans for us. The problem is, when it comes to listening to God, we are all a little ADD. Some of us more so than others. You know, We're so busy with our plan. We're so busy figuring out how to make our stuff work. We forget to listen to God and ascertain what his plan is and then ask him how we can implement that in our lives. So why is that? Why do we do that? Why are we ADD? One word answer. None of you will like it. I don't like it. Pride. We think our plan is so good, we don't need to consult God. Okay? And so off we go. Now some of us are worse than others. Uh, but we, we all suffer from one degree or another for that problem. So God is trying to get our attention. Number two, he has a better plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for, for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's God's plan for us. And if you, if you have your Bible open, and I hope you do, you, you circle hope and good because that's what God's plans give us God says my plans for you are good now again in the heat of the moment back to our dear friend Mary if you would have asked her at that point in time when she first discovered she was pregnant and, and maybe she just put it out of her mind and didn't believe it until the physical thing started showing up if you were to ask her do you think this is a good plan no, she would have said. Does this plan give you hope? No, this plan scares me to death. I'm probably going to die. This is a terrible plan. This is the worst plan of all possible plans. And yet it was God's plan to bring our Savior into this world. God says, Mary, I made you. I love you. And I have a purpose for you. He says the same thing to us. He made each and every one of us. He loves us. And he has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. You say, well, how do you know? Well, I know because his word tells us so. Yeah, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. What does he say? He says he created us for what? To do good works which he prepared beforehand. So not good works of our choosing, but good works which he prepared beforehand. So he has things he wants us to do, each and every one of us. 
And we just need to be about discerning what those are and then carrying them out. It always comes down to God's plan versus our plan. Doesn't mean our plans are bad. It just means his plans are better. See? And it's kind of like the thing, you know, where you go into the, get your driver's license and you do the eye test and this thing comes together. Or maybe it's the optometrist where you do that. But you have these two lines and they come and you're supposed to tell him when they come together. Well, that's kind of the way it is. We can have our plan, but we want to bring that plan right into line with God's. And when it comes into line with God's, then it's the plan he has for us. So let me tell you a little bit about God's plan for your life. You'll really like it. It's all good stuff. God's plan, for one, is bigger than your plan. Your plans, and I don't mean to be condescending, my plans are the same as your plans, in God's economy are pretty minuscule. They're pretty wimpy. They're, they're not very big. I mean, you think about it. Is, is your plan or my plan really going to have very much eternal significance? Yeah. One of the ways I've learned to deal with the grocery store lines is I ask myself a question. Because I'm one of those people, no matter which line I get in, it becomes the slowest line. <laughs> and it's also the line where this guy or gal decides to write a check for $2.95 item. And, you know, they can't just write the check and move on, but they have to write it in the to register and they have to write a memo about why they wrote it in the register and you're standing there, standing there, standing there reminding yourself you're a representative of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. So here's how I've come to cope with that. I ask myself the question, in eternity, how much difference is the next five minutes going to make? Yeah. Not much. So I stand in line. I still don't like it, but I'm able to cope with it a little better. And see, that's the thing with our plans. Our plans usually aren't big enough to make a whole lot of eternal difference. But when we're carrying out God's plan, then we are making a difference that will be eternal. Mary and Joseph, what'd they want? They just simply wanted to get married and live a simple life. That was their plan. Get married, have a family. God says, I want to bless the whole world through you. They had no idea. A carpenter and an average girl and their lives are going to be a blessing to the whole world? How can that be? They never would have imagined it, would they? Well, here's something for you to ponder as you're looking towards the new year. Your life and what you do with the rest of it may be a blessing to the whole world. Now, you may not be able to see any way that that could be possible. Just like Mary and Joseph, I'm sure, couldn't see any way it would be possible in their lives. But it was, wasn't it? Yes. It could be possible in your life. If you have the wisdom to recognize God's plan, and subordinate your plan to his. God says, I want to bless the whole world through you. And God says to you, I made you for a purpose and to me. And you have no idea, we have no idea how much God could do through us if we would just get with his program. You see? You say, but I'm old. Well, fine. So am I. You say, but I'm young. Well, fine. I was. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're sick, whether you're healthy. God can do things of eternal significance through your life. When you're totally committed to his plan, rather than that little plan, of yours. Number two. Now his plan being bigger than ours, that wasn't too bad. It, that was okay because he's going to supply the resources to carry out the plan. But number two, God's plan is more difficult than your plan. 
it's going to be harder on you than your plan will be. Because guess what we do when we make our plans? We don't make it difficult on ourselves, do we? Of course not. But sometimes God does. We don't like that. But this is why so many cut out on him. This is why you see Christians, they accept Christ as their Savior, they flourish for a little while, you know, and then they kind of fade away. Because God starts working on them. And he starts beating off the hard edges, you know. And it's like in Proverbs where it talks about men, you know, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And how does that work? You bang it together and knock the pieces off. I don't like that. I want to keep my pieces. But God says, no, we're going to keep beating on you until we smooth you out and you're useful in my kingdom. It's harder. Do you think, do you think it was easy for Mary and Joseph? Now that we've, we've built some context around this story. Now, they're in, a, they're in Nazareth. Remember, they're going to go to Bethlehem later, but they're in Nazareth. Small town. Everybody knows everybody. Now today, if Sally down the street gets pregnant because of our society, it's no big deal, nobody cares. But in those days, it was different, wasn't it? Capital offense. Can you imagine? Mary and Joseph thinking, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to cope with this? Everybody in town will know shortly. Can you imagine the gossip that would have went around? An unwed mother, pregnant with this wild story. You can think about it. What if it was you? You know, and your your uh, fiance comes to you and says, and, and you know you haven't had sex yet. Your fiance comes to you and says, "Hey, by the way, I'm pregnant." You what? Well, who's the father? God. What? What do you mean, God? The Holy Spirit. He came to me and he said. I was going to be pregnant by God and oh by the way the baby's going to be God you gonna buy that story I doubt it now I'm doing a lot of paraphrasing here but again these were just two young kids and they didn't know all the stuff we know they didn't have the New Testament so that's pretty much the way it unfolded I'd say that was a pretty tough deal for them. Mary must have asked God a thousand times, why? Why me? Why this? Why now? Just when my life was going good, just when everything was coming together, why now? Another thing about God, isn't it? Oftentimes, just when we think we've got it all together, what happens? God interrupts. The reason he does that is because he is more interested in our character than in our comfort. And I want to remember that. God is more interested in your spiritual character than in your comfort. I don't like that either. But that's the truth. And so he works on us until he knocks all those rough edges off. Well now, in the midst of all this though, there's some good news. Yes, God's plan is harder, it is bigger, but it is also more rewarding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Paul tells us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And can we not apply that to Mary and Joseph? They couldn't imagine what was going to happen. They had no way to know what was ahead of them. Mary and Joseph's plan was just to get married. God's was to save the world. Now which do you think was the most rewarding? I think God's. God had a purpose for Mary and Joseph's lives. And he also has a perfect purpose for yours. But if we're going to discover and carry out that purpose this Christmas, 
we must learn to trust him and that's difficult it's much easier to trust ourselves it's much easier to trust our bank account it's much easier to trust whatever I was went on a little trip with Sue a week or so ago and ended up in a doctor's office in Pocatello Idaho and I, I wish I would have asked but this doctor had a sign in his office I couldn't believe he had it in there and it said if you are in really good health it simply means you are dying more slowly than others <laughs> and I, I thought, why would you have a sign like that and, a, and I didn't think to ask well, isn't, that, isn't that comforting so, so we tend to, you know, so we're healthy and everything's fine, you know, and boom, it can be gone just like that. You know, we're wealthy, we've invested a lot, we've got millions of dollars, boom, it can be gone, we don't know. We need to learn to trust in God. Now, can you imagine the faith that Joseph must have had? We've talked a lot about Mary. But what about poor old Joseph? You know, in Hebrews 11.6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The reason it's impossible to please God without faith is because if we don't have faith in God, we will never step out and try to accomplish the things He is calling us to accomplish because they're going to be too big. They're going to be too hard. So we have to be able to believe that God will provide. So, what about Joseph? As we said, what if your fiancé came to you with a story? Would you buy it? No. <laughs> no. Joseph didn't buy it. You, you read the story in the scripture, Joseph didn't believe that tale for one minute. What was his response? What was he going to do? He was going to divorce her. But, and I, I realize in our sense they weren't married yet but you remember in their sense they were as good as married so he was going to put her away quietly now the reason he was going to put her away quietly is because though he didn't buy her story he was a kind and loving man he could have simply took her out to the town square and said stone her but he wanted to get out of this thing he didn't want to be married to her because she'd been unfaithful to him as far as he knew but, on the other hand, he was still a kind and good man, so he didn't want to cause her any more problems than she already had. Okay? So Joseph doesn't believe this story. But then you remember that he had a dream. And God spoke to him and said, It's okay. This is my plan. I'm working this out. You do it. And so he went ahead and kept marrying. But he was going to call the whole thing off. Now, can you imagine his discouragement? You think about it. Here he's worked his, all his young life and he had learned his trade and he was doing well. And you know, just for the sake of the story, we'll say that uh, Mary was the, the queen of the prom and all that sort of thing. He, she was the girl in town and he had her all locked up and uh, they were ready to spend their whole lives together. Everything was looking good. And then this comes along. Can you imagine how he must have felt? Discouraged, disappointed, depressed maybe. Why did God lead me here just to jerk the rug out from under me? Why? Again, that question we ask. But then God spoke to Joseph through the angel. Let me read that for you. It's in Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 24. And her husband Joseph, being just a man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, now, this is the important part. 
He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we find out who we worship, ourselves or our God. When God speaks to us in various and sundry ways as he does, when he said his peace, do we do what he has told us to do? Or do we go on our merry way doing exactly what we wanted to do? Albeit what we wanted to do may not be a bad thing. But God tells us to do something different. And the whole key is right there in, the, in that verse 24. When he awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel told him to do. Folks, I'll tell you. God's plans often do not make sense to us when he first reveals them to us. They don't. And oftentimes they don't look like they're going to be the best thing for us. Oftentimes they don't look like the best course of action. Oftentimes they look like they're going to even put us in jeopardy in some way or another. But if we can have the faith of Joseph and do as God says for us to do, the results are going to be more than we can ever imagine. Because we won't even know the results until we get to heaven. In a lot of cases. You won't know the lives you've touched. You won't know the people you've influenced. You won't know the things you've changed until you can view them from an eternal perspective. Then and only then will you know. But then God spoke to Joseph. And Joseph did as God said. So this Christmas, you may be feeling a little bit like Mary and Joseph. Maybe you're discouraged about one thing or another. Maybe you're wondering, why is it always so difficult for me? Every time I think I've got a handle on it, it slips away. Every time I think I've got it figured out, I don't. Why is that? And we ask God, why is that? If this is God's plan, why doesn't he make it easier? <laughs> Isn't that a question we all have? You know, if, if it's, it's like when I was in, in seminary. If it's his plan for me to learn Greek, why doesn't he make it easier? <laughs> it's like beating my head against the wall. It's the hardest thing I ever did. You know? And Hebrew, forget it. Yeah. Why didn't Jesus just speak English like everybody else? <laughs> yeah. If this is God's plan for my life, why doesn't he make it easier? My plan was to retire at about 45 or 50. I've missed it by a couple of years. Yeah. Why? Seems to me like it had been just as easy for God to have blessed me so I could have retired at 45 or 50. <laughs> well, I was. <laughs> you know. We don't know. But when I get to eternity and I'm able to look at things from an eternal perspective, I'll be able to see, oh, there, 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 there. That's why. And so will you. Perhaps 2013 was a tough year. It was a difficult year. Good news. God is speaking to you just as he spoke to Joseph, saying, listen to me, trust me, obey me, act. He's saying to you the same thing he said through Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. I have plans for you, not for evil, but for good, to give you a future and to give you a hope. Those are God's plans for you. So this Christmas, as you contemplate the birth of our Savior, not to take anything of the joy away, because we know the rest of the story, but try to remember Mary and Joseph. 
and their part they played in this eternal pageant and the struggle they went through to become the people they are today think about it. Mary and Joseph are known around the world you know they're revered Mary in some cases more so than she ought to be but we revere them as great people of faith and so they should be but we are the same we have the same flesh the same blood we have the same Heavenly Father as Mary and Joseph he has the same sort of plans for us plans for good so spend a little time this Christmas just meditating on what God's been telling you and what he might have you do in the coming year to fit into his plan because your plan may be to retire your plan may be to make it through school your plan may be to do whatever it is to make the team God's plan is to save the world and he wants to include you in that plan that's pretty exciting pray with me Lord thank you that you do have a plan and it is uh, bigger more difficult than ours but it is also more rewarding and so Lord give us the, the courage and the faith to put our trust in you and follow your plan Lord whatever that be because we know it's a world-changing plan and that one day we will be able to look back and see the impact we had or didn't have according to whether or not we fit into your plan and so oh God thank you for being our Savior thank you for Christmas we just pray that you will give us a great time as we gather this Christmas Eve to focus on you as we begin the celebration of your birth in Jesus name Amen <laughs>